Shalom. Here we are, once again, with a new lesson in the series, The People of Israel Are Coming Home. Today, we will study chapter 11, Perak Yud Aleph. Actually, we will not discuss the entire chapter. We will study the first half, and the second half we will study together with chapter 12, Perak Yud Bet, in our next lesson. Today, I want to study the first half of chapter Yud Aleph, Perak Yud Aleph, chapter 11. We're talking about verses 1 to 15. Pasuk Aleph until Pasuk Tetvav. The story here refers to the final battle described in the book of Joshua. We're talking about the battle against the Northern Coalition. Chapter begins... Vayehi kishmoa Yavin Melech Chatzor. It happened when Yavin, the king of Chatzor, heard of this. Heard of this means he heard of what we studied about in the, in the previous chapter, referring to the coalition of the southern kings. He sent, he sent out to call Yovav, Melech king of Madon, Melech Shimron, Melech Avshav. He's getting himself organized for, for going out to fight against the Israelites. Vayetzu heim v'chol machanehem All of these kings together gather and get ready for the battle. This is the verses Aleph to He 1 to 5. The story is summarized in verse 15, Pasuk Tetvav. כאשר ציבה אדוני את משה אבדו, כן ציבה משה את יהושע, just as God had commanded his servant Moses, משה, so to Moshe commanded Joshua, and so he did, and the, and the verse emphasizes, לא הסיר דבר מכל אשר ציבה אדוני את משה. He did not omit one thing, at all, of all Hashem had commanded Moshe. So this is the story. The story of the battle between the kings of the northern coalition and Israel. This, of course, reminds us of the same thing we read in the previous chapter, in chapter 10, Perak Yud. Though Perak Yud, the story is, much, is described in much more length. We're talking about 42 verses until Pasuk Membet, and then finally Vayashav Yoshua in Pasuk Mem Gimel in the 43rd verse, Joshua returns back home to the Gilgal. Here, the story is described in only 15 verses. But we see there are many, many parallel phrases in both of the stories. I'll just give a few for example. The both stories begin the exact same way. Vayihi Kishmoa, when the kings heard in chapter 10 Perik Yud, it's in Pasuk Aleph in the first verse, in chapter 11 Perik Yud Aleph, it also appears in the first verse, Vayihi Kishmoa there it's the southern kings Vayihi Kishmoa Adoni Tzedek Melech Yerushalayim and he calls upon Vayishlach, he organizes a coalition and so to here Yavin, the king of Chatzor, organizes a coalition. Vayishlach el Yovav, Melech Madon. He sends out to the other kings, the king of Madon, the king of Shimron, the king of Achshaf, and to all the kings which are up the north. Vel HaMelachim Asher Mitzafon. So he calls several kings. In all both cases, in chapter 11, it's in Pasuk Vav, Vayomer Adonai el Yehoshua, Al Tira Mipnehem. God encourages Joshua, don't worry. Machar ka'etazot anochino tenet kulam chalalim lifnei Israel. Tomorrow morning, I will deliver all of them as corpse, corpses before Israel. The same exact exact thing appears in chapter 10. Vayomer Adonai Yeshua, in Pasuk Chet, verse 8. Vayomer Adonai Yeshua, al tira mehem ki biyadcha netatim lo yamot behem ish befanecha. So we start off with the king's hearing, going out and organizing the coalition, God encouraging Joshua that everything will be okay. Joshua goes out and attacks suddenly, 
As it says in Perak Yud Aleph, chapter 11, Pasuk Zayin, verse 7, Vayavo Yoshua v'chol ama milchama himu alehem al meimarom pitom, and Joshua comes suddenly, so too is the same exact story in chapter 10. Vayavo alehem Yoshua pitom, suddenly. So we, ha- we, we, in both cases, the king's here, they organize a coalition, God encourages Joshua, and together, suddenly, Joshua and his land and his war surprise the kings. We then on we can see that in both cases, after Joshua attacks the enemy, God actually helps Joshua, and Joshua manages to defeat. And Joshua does and attacks them exactly as God has told them. And in both cases, the enemy is offended, they are attacked by Joshua, and they both stories conclude that after the defeat, after the victory, Joshua returns back to the camp. So we see two stories that are actually parallel. But when we see two stories that are parallel, we want to see the differences. And what's important here is the differences. Because when we look at the story, it's a very interesting emphasis in the differences. We're in chapter 10, Perak Yud. The kings organized the coalition not to attack the Israelites, but rather to attack the Givonites. Why? Because they heard that the Israelites made peace with the Givonim. We're meaning that the kings heard what happened, and they are frightened. And they are afraid of, of the people of Israel. So they are in sort of a coalition of defense. They're the description is a description of, of these four small kings who are afraid of what the, Joshua is going is to do after he made peace with the given. In our story, in chapter 11, all these kings are actually described as a very strong coalition. They go out, them and their entire camp. Am Rav Kachol Asher Osfatayom, a large force as numerous as the sand of the sea. Vesus Varechev Rav Meod, and they have many horses and chariots. So this description is of a very mighty army, like sand of the sea. For the first time in, in the entire book, we're mentioning horses and chariots. So here, Joshua isn't a problem. He's going to have to go out to fight and defend himself. The Israelites don't have any horses, don't have any chariots. And what would he expect right now? As we read through the book of Joshua, we would expect right now the the verses to describe a very great miracle that suddenly God comes and and there's a miracle. As we saw in the previous chapter, stones coming from the heaven or the sun Standing Shemesh Begivon Dom. But there's no story about that anymore. In this chapter, we're surprised. Ironically, when we have the strongest army coming out, fighting the Israelites, here, we were, we, where we would mostly expect a great miracle, it doesn't come. Supposedly, it doesn't come. Because the entire message of the book of Joshua, which we spoke about from the very beginning until here, is this message. The beginning of the story, we spoke about four different battles are described in the book. The first two are against one single city, Jericho and the Ai. The second two are against the coalition of kings. The first one, Jericho, was totally a war led by God himself. He tumbled down the walls and therefore the booty was forbidden. In the second story, the eye, God actually only gave the st- strategy, but the actual fighting was the people of Israel. We see the process from miracle to nature. But even in this story of nature, the people of Israel had to understand that this was the hand of God. The second part of the description of battles in the book of, Jer- of Joshua talks about the battles against coalitions of kings. In the first story, We had the intervening of God with miracles. Stones 
hailing down from heaven. The sun and the moon standing in their place. These were great miracles. Here, the, the verses don't describe any story about a supernatural miracle. What happened? We don't know. And this is the big message of the whole story. We don't know what, how, how, how the Israelites overcame these horses and chariots. Probably. Usually in these cases. Maybe some rain and storm that the horses lost, lost balance. So we don't know exactly. We can imagine anything. What we do know is that the people of Israel, without any supernatural miracle, managed to overcome this great force. And here is a great message. We would expect that after the Israelites managed to overcome the, this big coalition, they would take all their horses and take all their chariots. And here we are surprised. God says to them, No. God commands the people. Vayomer Adonai el Yoshua, in verse 6, Pasuk Vav, Et suseihem te aker vet markevotehem tisrof ba'esh. You shall cripple their horses and burn the chariots. Why? We would expect the people of Israel to take over all these chariots and all these horses. No. This is the message. Even when you manage to fight the first battle that Israelites fight as sort of a regular army, if they would take the chariots and the horses, they would think the spirit, the might, the energy, the power comes from the horses and the chariots. Comes God and tells them. Even when we finally get to the point where the Israelites are ready to be a regular nation in their land, they have to remember that it's not the horses and it's not the chariots. And even these big, great big armies, these great big forces were so frightening. God's major part in history is wrapped not with these supernatural miracles, bread coming from heaven, walls tumbling down, no. God's main aspect of presence in the world is when it's not so obvious, when there's no supernatural be- uh, miracle, when the people of Israel are fighting as a regular army and they don't put their faith in horses, in chariots, but in, rather in God. And here we reach the main point, the main message of the book of Joshua. After we saw all the process of Jericho and the eye, from miracle to natural. We saw the story of the southern kings who were frightened and they ran away, but we, we managed to surprise them, but God, upon the request of Joshua, stops the sun and, 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 and the moon. Here we see, finally, we reach the point where supposedly there is no part of God in the day-to-day life. But there are two points where God does appear in this chapter. At the beginning, when he encourages the people, yes, he encourages them to follow his way and to have faith in him. And finally, in the final sentence, when the verses teach us that the people were obedient to the word of God. Ka'asher tziva Adonai. As God commanded, they were obedient. The people of Israel, finally capturing the land, finally concluding this main mission of conquering the land. We will see the next half of Joshua, they will deal with the dividing of the land. But in the first half, the conquering of the land, the people of Israel had to learn this message. We are leaving a status of living on miracles. We're going to be living on a day-to-day life in faith of God. This will be much more, I would say, with made much, much, many more obstacles and many more questions. Where is God? We don't see Him. But here, this is the main message. You're going to be living in a land of yourself. You're going to be a light to the nations by the very fact that your everyday life will express your faith and sanctifying of God's name in the world. And by this, the people of Israel coming in to the land of Israel will bring Israel as a light to all nations. Shalom.